Um, welcome. Welcome to my mate HR, the career sessions. Today we're talking to Chris Williams, founder of Proper LinkedIn Marketing. Um, Chris is someone who I saw on the LinkedIn profile a long time ago. He was recommended to me actually after a networking event where I got quite drunk and was quite loud. And someone said, you really should follow this guy, Chris. He'll really, really resonate with you as a person. Um, so obviously with these sessions, we talk to everyday people about their careers and Chris has very kindly agreed to come and talk about his. Um, so yeah, Chris, thank you for joining us. So thank you for having me. Thank you for the introduction. I, I'm glad I was a drunken referral. It was weird, really but they were on. Yeah, yeah and, that, and that you felt, you felt you would resonate as a person. <laughs> no, no, I've never seen you done, Tracy, so I'm going to take that as a compliment. It was a compliment, you're fine. And I also did one of Chris's course uh, um, towards the end of last year in terms of my own LinkedIn profile, and it was excellent. So that's uh, how I know Chris on a more detailed level rather than just stalking him on LinkedIn. Um, so Chris is here to talk about his career today. So Chris, um, just tell us a bit about your career journey. So where, where, where are we where are we starting? Are we starting? Where you want to. Starting where you want to. So the, the, the preamble we had just before we, we started recording I was mentioning my nickname is a paper boy. So I've got to get that in, haven't I? There's, you there's do. Lascargo, um, which means snail if you don't know in French, um, which was pretty much the foundation for my entire work ethic. Um, for the following 30 years so uh yeah my my first proper job when i left uh left college was as a police officer um uh, my dream as a child was to be a rugby player i got a, a contract with uh, a professional rugby club and ended up breaking my neck so that kind of put a dampener on me doing that Wow. Um, so uh, went into the police force, Westminster Police Force, uh, moved to the West Midlands from uh, North Nottinghamshire, and became a copper. And that was that was the first real job that I had. And again, there's a, there's a bit of a theme with all of my roles. Um, I was shit at that. So <laughs> after three years, uh, I left. What, why were you? Why yeah, I'm you curious. Know? How how precisely were you shit at being a policeman? I, I was, the main reason why I joined the police force, if I'm being brutally honest, was because when I was playing rugby, one of the guys who was the physio who actually helped me when I, when I, I had my injury was a police sergeant in Nottinghamshire Police. And he says, you know, the, the, the police service does have quite a decent high level rugby team. Um, and I was like, oh, um, and that was the sole reason for wanting to be a copper. Um, because I because I couldn't get insurance to play at a, a semi pro or a, a pro level or anything like that, it was well I need to be able to earn at, at the same time I do what I want to do. So so my focus was playing rugby rather than actually policing the streets of Birmingham. Um, and I wasn't very good at in my early days. I wasn't very good at, at, at being PC, not a police constable. Well, I wasn't very good at that. And I wasn't very good at being politically correct, which was also a, a nail in the coffin with stuff and now obviously i'm a i'm a I'm, you know i'm a proper virtue sigma on all things pc yeah, um, but uh, yeah so uh, the for me it was the politics yeah i am not very good when i see something that that i don't agree with i can't just zip that and it, it just comes out so certain things when you're being asked to crime something because the stats aren't particularly good for the area and you're having to crime it as something different um not not okay with that um and there were lots lots of other things as well and this was this was back in 2003 um when the new sexual offenses act had just been brought in as well um so there was uh, forced training on the new sexual offenses act uh, and the, uh, say forced um because it's new law every police officer has to go through they have to understand the legislation and the law behind it and then mm. and all that sort of stuff and the classrooms that I attended with other officers, it was quite, quite evident at that stage, even, you know, nearly 30 years ago, that there was still a massive, massive problem with uh, sexual problems within the police force. Right. And the, 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 the thought and, and a lot of the, the, the banter, as it was called, um, wasn't particularly good, considering that, you know, that the, the new Sexual Offences Act had just been introduced yeah. to try and help the, the, the issues, which we've still got today. 
So, yeah, so please, um, this took a dark turn quick, didn't it? <laughs> you promised me that fun and laughter and all that crap. Well, I can't, I can't wait to see where we go next. And, and being sacked. Um, so yeah, so that, I, I, I jumped before I was I was pushed um, in that in that job. Um, Isn't it really hard to get sacked as a policeman? Oh, it's incredibly hard. You, you can either. Um, I was going to make a joke, then I'm. I'm yeah, 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 I yeah, I, yeah. I'm let's not going to get that yet. <laughs> But yeah, it, 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 particularly back then, it was it was very hard. One of the and, and I'll, I'll mention this because it's a I still think it's a flipping brilliant joke. Um, when when I, when we went through Wrighton, so Wrighton's the the, the local training centre for West or for, for a lot of the police forces north of um, uh, 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 the Met. So Wrighton, Wrighton on Dunsmore, Coventry is, is there. And while we were there, we were being told about what is right and what's not wrong in terms of, you know, appropriate behaviour as a police officer um, and that they are trying to combat, um, you know, the sex discrimination and things like that and racial discrimination. And one of the things that was introduced in the 90s, I say it was introduced, it more formulated, was, was banter. And it was having, a, it was called having a blag. So you would blag colleagues as a way of, of bonding, as a way of taking the piss, that sort of thing. Uh, and there's lots of different blags, like, you know, if you was a, you was a new procon, new, new police constable, your, your sergeant would, would ask you to go and check the brake lights of the car, and you'd get out and you'd fuck off. So you've got to walk back to the station. So little blags like that. And they were introduced to sort of combat what was called, you know, things like um, the office stamp, which was a WPC having the office stamp slapped on our arse. Which was, you know, something way before my time, but obviously isn't appropriate. Now, there's one blag that I was told about that I, I'm not going to say whether I was involved in it at all or had anything to do with it, but it's a good story. And it was, it was blagging um, if you went onto the traffic department. Now, if you went onto traffic, one of the parts of your your PDP, which is your professional development portfolio, you know what they are, um, is to deal with certain situations competently, and then you have to get them signed off by uh, by a, uh, a sergeant. If you're doing, if you're fortunate enough to do a traffic secondment during your pro if, during your two, first two years, um, a lot of the things that you have to get signed off in your book can be done quite quickly because you go into traffic incidents, you go into fatalities and things like that so you can tick them off quite quick mm. one of the things that's in your pdp is to deal with dead body now again this is going to turn a little bit dark but there's, there's humor behind it so bear with me so part of the, the the blag was to take a new procon to the the local morgue or the hospital morgue whatever it is and to show them uh, a body so they can be signed off that you've seen a dead body you've you've dealt with it and that sort of thing so the blank was to take them there and somebody would be on the mat. So they'd open the fridge, they'd pull it out. And as the program pulled back, you go, rah, you shit. So that, that, that was a, a blank. And you think that, you know, that's, that's quite a, a decent level winding the hell up. And, so, and there's, you know, I'm sure lots of people didn't like it, but that was part and parcel of it. That wasn't the blank though. The blag was to get that same procon who had the live shit out of him a couple of weeks before to now be part of the team by getting him to sit on the fridge slide and to be put in the fridge. And you tell him, oh, by the way, you know, we've got a new procon coming out. We're going to bring him down. Do you want to be the body on the, on the fridge? Yeah, of course I do. I want to be part of the team. So you put him in the fridge, close it down, and about five minutes later, the body next to him goes, it's fucking cold in here, isn't it, mate? <laughs> now, that, that was the blame. Now, now I, I'd heard that had happened a few times. I don't know whether it had or not, but... Humour was it was a big part of having to deal with um, <laughs> shitty incidents in the police, and it was a yeah. very it was a very quick three years, but it was a very educational three years that I was there. So, what happened next then? Um, after that, um, I it's going to get dark again in a minute. So, I, I left the police. Um, I was still playing club rugby and things like that, which was uh, you know the, the keeping my, my 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 smile going a little bit. Um, and I did a bit of security contract work. Any ex-copper can walk straight into contract work with, with security. Uh, I did that for about, about nine months or so. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was at my mum's house back up in Nottingham. And, and she says, have you thought about anything that you want to do? Are you going to do security for the rest of your life? 
And I was like, not really, because the hours are crap. And the pay's good, but the hours are crap. Um, and she says, why don't you do something? You've always wanted to, uh, we used to have a, a pub as, as a family, as a kid. Um, you said you always want to do that. Why don't you do that? So I did what any um, self-respecting human being would do and applied for weather spoons. Yeah, nice. don't, 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 um, yeah. So anyway, I got, uh, because of the, being a copper, I got through onto a management course, got through, got, got my license, and within, uh, within four months, I've got, been given my own pub in Tamworth. Um, not as full licensee, but as relief manager. Mm -hmm. So worked that, and uh, I did that for the next three years. And that's where I met the, the, the lady in my life and uh, had our first kid in Tamworth and then another one. So that in terms of, of career progression, you'll see it's like that all the way. Um, but at, so at that, you say you had your first kiss or your first kid? Kid. Oh, kid. So you I was a rugby player, love. I'd, I'd had my first kiss in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, with your wife. <laughs> Oh, with, 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 yes. uh, with, she, she, she was an employee. That was um, again. I was like not, at Weatherspoons. Yeah, yeah Weatherspoons. Yeah, that's so, really uh, romantic. Oh, so, so romantic! I, I'm really hoping she doesn't listen to this. Um, <laughs> was it in the stock room? Was it? <laughs> I'm not saying anything about that. <laughs> <part of mine. laughs> so yeah, I was. Uh, I worked for Weatherspoons. Um, that ended with me being jabbed with a, a needle. Um, uh, in so the, the, the weather spoons that I ran, um, we didn't think there was a drug problem in the area, and there was. I was emptying a bin, and something got in my hand, and I went, Oh, like that. And it was a hypodermic needle, a used one. So I ended up having to take time off and have HIV tests and all that sort of stuff. And it was, I think it was a six week wait to find out whether all oh, hep B and all that came back quite quick, but HIV it was quite a long process to wait so uh, yeah I decided pub life wasn't yeah I can understand that yeah. yeah that must have been the longest six weeks of your life it was it, yeah it was it was not a particular nice time that probably contributed to I, I, I you, you, it's probably well documented on LinkedIn that I, I, I've gone through bouts of depression throughout my life um, and that I wouldn't say was a catalyst but that was part of yeah um what then so, so when i left left there that's when i started uh my, my first real sort of um uh, this first bit of depression that that i dealt with properly yeah. um there was a there's a bout before when i left the police um which i've documented on the ted talk and things like that mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. people have seen but yeah that, that wasn't a particularly good time yeah mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, you understandably decided to leave the pub industry, which yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's not great. Uh, so what what happened? So did you take some time out then because of how you were feeling, or I did? Yeah, so we, we took um, took time off um, while that was doing. I did again. I did a bit more contract work with security. Ended up doing um, uh, night relief, so I ended up working night shifts again for a while yeah. while my kid was two she just turned two something like that which wasn't really good or one and a half two so mm -hmm. it wasn't particularly great um and then uh my mum sent me a, a a video link of uh, an ad on I think it was facebook or something like that at the time uh, it might 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 even even be myspace i think it might have <laughs> been myspace um and it was um of, of a, an it company in the area that i lived um that they were guaranteeing a job at the end of um a training traineeship um and the, the you know it was a guaranteed job it was a six week residential traineeship it was only around the corner so i didn't have to stay there all the time so you know the kid was all all, all good um so i thought fuck it do it um and i got i got, I got a job after the, those six weeks of, of uh, and it's tickled me. I was in a room with people. So this was a government scheme that was getting people um, into employment within the IT industry because there was a shortage at the time. Mm -hmm. And the most people in the room were newly qualified or, or newly graduated um, computer science graduates. And they couldn't get a job in IT. Oh. And there's a bloke who, who, who kicks the ball around and, and, and has been a copper. And I'm in the same guy that these people have got different yeah. degrees in it. So it was really weird to, 
to sort of be associated with, with, with all that sort of thing. Um, but I got a job at a, a large recruitment firm on the back of that, which was, so I was in the data side, so the IT desk and the data side. Um, and I'm not going to mention that, 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 that name. It has been documented in the past, but it wasn't particularly, it was a good, good time and there were some good things that happened from it. Um, but it wasn't, it was that when it was decided that I was unemployable, that role. Right. Um, but I, I spent a good few years there. And I'm going to blow smoke at me on our arse now. Um, I was good at what I did. Uh, I was so good at what I did that I was given a business from the back of it. Um, the, the chairman believed in what, what I was saying to them. They gave me a quarter of a million quid and said, go and be your own director, set your own business up, give us a return. Um, what that, was it, do you think? What was it that gave them that faith in you? Um, I, if I see something that I want to achieve, I will not stop until I've got it. Right. Um, and I think it was the fact that I was willing to... I don't know. I, the, the, the one thing, the first time I ever met the chairman um, and he walked through our office, um, as he did every now and again, telling everybody how good the, the business was. Um, and he would point, he goes, what do you do for me? In this big baritone voice. Um, and I, I said, well, I, I, I look after your WTR system, which is your the holiday accrual system. Uh, he goes, all oh, right, so what's our liability? So, as you know, in, in HR, there's, there's, there's a liability to how much a company is owed, or owes their staff in terms of um, finance, in terms of holiday hours, that sort of stuff. Now, because it was a recruitment firm and because they were, they were placing up to 25, 26,000 attempts, huge amount of, um, of, of, of cash that should be in the pot mm -hmm. um, in terms of that liability. Yeah. Um, and I, I knew what the figures were. I presided, presented those figures to him every single week in the boardroom, not me personally, but through the finance. And I told him, and he says, no, that's not correct. And I went, yes, it is. Uh, and he said, why? And I explained it to him. And I was right. And he went away. And it transpired that the information that he was being given on board wasn't quite as accurate as the information I was given. <laughs> whether, whether that, the fact that I stood up and went, no, 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 this is right. And, and, and yeah. actually, rather than kissing his ass, I don't know if that was it. Yeah. But, yeah. So when I stood in the boardroom and presented this idea for a new business, boom, there's the cash, Chris, go and do it. Brilliant. Um, which was good. Two years of working my ass off um, for it to fail. So that was uh, that was another learning curve. My whole my whole journey, my whole life journey has been about failures. So um, but I don't see it as being. Now you learn. I'm not one of these bullshitters that goes about. Oh, but you've got to fail to be able to learn. No. It, it hurts like hell when you feel yeah. like shit. It does. You do learn shit tons from it, though, at the same oh, time. Do. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And and I I learned I wasn't ready for the business. I, I didn't have the, the tenacity. I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't have, I didn't have anything other than the gift of the gap and, and an idea. Uh, and I didn't really know how to, to, to action that idea. So after two years, they, they pulled the funds and said, look, you've got a job here if you want to, um, or you can go and do your own thing. Um, it was a chat with my chairman of the group that we set up, um, whose advice was Chris, don't take this the wrong way, but you are fucking un unemployable. And I was like, yeah, I, I think I know that. And my inspector in the police said that to me as well. So, so I, with with three months worth of savings, so I, I decided to go out on my own. Okay. Didn't have a fucking clue what I was going to do. Wait, how long so, ago was that then? So that was in 20, 2015. Okay. Uh, 2015, back end of 2015. Um, the guy that I'd hired to, uh, and this is where, where this whole business came from now. So I, I hired a developer to build this, this the, the website for the, the business. It was a platform. Um, mm -hmm. And he went on holiday and I was desperate to get somebody to do a bit of work for me while this other guy was on holiday. And we'd sponsored a, a National Freelancer Day uh, down in London. And the winner was, a, was a, an IT geek who'd won it and and I, I picked up the phone I said look I know I know that you know you, you've won the award and we've given you your prize he, he came to have a, a meal up at Meriden Hall and we did oh, I've just given give it away where it is never mind um we, we can put a bleep there can't we um but but he I said to him look I need you to uh to come and help me with this are you happy doing that and he came on and he helped me and he, he was really good at what he did 
Um, and it, that forms um, a, re- a good relationship between me and Paul, um, who, who was the guy. So when uh, the, pool, the, the plug was pulled on uh, that business, um, I, I said to Paul, I said, look, I, I need to do something. What do you suggest that we do? And he says, why we? And I said, because I trust you and I like what you do. And I think we can probably do something together. And so we did. Um, we built a product called Squish. I say we. He built a product called Squish. I sold it. Um, and that then later became Doddle, which is our, where you did the course, that software that you did the yeah. course on. Um, and that's where we started getting into the marketing game. And so we, we worked out very quickly at the back end of 2016, 2017, that a product is easier to sell if they're already using it. So we started marketing uh, online courses and different things like that to get people onto the product. And we've, uh, we've only, I think we've only got about four, four, five, four or 5,000 users on it, something like that. But that was the, 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 the first sort of snip, start of 2017, that we were actually quite good at marketing. Um, so we, we sort of diversified um, and, and started selling the marketing services rather than the product. Because if people brought the marketing services, they would be using the product. So it kind of worked that way. Um, and then in 2018, back end of 2018, all of our success was coming via LinkedIn. So we, we focused every single penny, every single bit worth on, on LinkedIn marketing. And, and here we are now. Wow. So you said it was called Squish and it was renamed? Doddle. Doddle, okay. Don't, don't, don't ask me where Squish came from. <laughs> I have not got a clue. <laughs> Absolutely not got a clue. It was what it what it was originally. So this was the, the original design. So I am, and if anyone's in the creative industry, they'll know about scope creep. That's when a, a client will, will will agree to a term to say you're going to provide this service to me, and then when that service is provided, they go, oh, can you just add? So that you know they're trying to get a little bit more. Now I was that knobby client with Paul. So when it when he when he sort of saw what the job was, he gave me a quote, uh, he got the work done, and then when he'd finished, I went, Paul, could you just add this little bit? Uh, and he went, yeah, okay. And he built a reply system, literally overnight, which managed that process. So every time I said, could you just add, it would, he would then send it back saying, yes, here's the cost. So it was all trackable. So it was like a bit of a project management piece. Yeah. So that, that was the very first Squish product that we had, and it was built to manage me stop, to stop me. Being <laughs> I like that. So it, that, that was how, how Squish started. And then when, when, um, when we sort of went out on our own with it, um, it, it developed into a more full project management software yeah. piece of kit. We went after Trello right at the time when they just announced a 300 million investment bad idea um so we we sort of thought well we've got all of this productivity uh, enablement within the platform nobody's using it because trello is all over the news and then monday.com got rebranded to monday and, and i can't think what that was called before but so what they were, we were in a market that was dominated by four or five big project management software pieces um and so we we ended up trying to work out how best we could use this piece of software and make money from it Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where we sort of diversified down and go, well, actually, if we get, if we can deliver things via it, yeah. people have to use it to yes. be working with us. So, that, and that's where the, the, the marketing aspect came. <laughs> yeah. Not a clue where, where, where Doddle came from, it came from as, it's a Doddle. That was the... Yeah, yeah. That's the, good. The that's so, exactly what it says. Well, not exactly what it says on the tin, but at least how easy it should be to do it. Simple. And that's, that's what it was. I did say the dog might interrupt. He has literally just gone to the door. We've got a little a bell, and he's just rang the bell to say he wants to go out. You've got a bell for your dog. Do it. Yeah, yeah. He rings. He rings the bell. Do you want to go out, or do you want to sit back? No, he's looking at me like I've just cut his balls off. He was <laughs> there two days ago. It wasn't me. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Dora. <laughs> Amazing. So does that does that bring us up to the present day then? Uh, kind of. So. 20 uh, back into 2018 um uh, we we niched purely onto linkedin marketing so that's where we're getting the results since then we've uh we got right up to the pandemic yeah uh, we had 34 managed service clients um lost overnight when the first lockdown was announced yeah um 
and it was, I, can remember, I remember sitting here in this exact chair and I was just looking at my emails and it was client one, client two, client three, client four. And they're all saying the same. Can we pause everything? Can we pause everything? And as that, I've got an active PL sheet. So every time a client joins or that, I, I remove it so I can see what the cash forecast is. Yeah. And, and I, I can remember ringing Paul up and I, it was almost like I was watching my stocks drop. Mm-hmm. Um, I rang Paul up and says, we're, we're literally losing everyone. Um, and, and he said, well, at least we've got the subscribers to platforms so that, that can. Um, and then they started bouncing. Everyone was just, just stopping direct debits and things like that. Yeah. So we were like, shit, that's not good. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was LinkedIn that, that came to the rescue. So the first message that I put out once that, that was done is you're going to see a flood of people now pulling all their marketing spend because they don't understand marketing. Mm-hmm. And it got quite a lot of uh, negative comments saying, oh, we've got to make sure that, you know, we're here in the future and marketing has got, you know, we've got to cut the costs and all that sort of stuff. And, and that one post, 30, 40,000 views, something like that. But it got one person on it, sent me a message, never heard of them before, never seen before, sent me a message, um, can we have a chat? We need to be able to market this pandemic. And, it, and that was the first client that we took on. And that was day three after we started losing all these clients. Yeah. Um, and since then, we, we've, we've gone to being, you know, we, we don't have as many managed services because we focus a lot of our effort now um, on, on mentorship and, and, and yeah. training um, because you know there's, there's so many LinkedIn gurus and ninjas or whatever you want to coaches and experts out there that are all self-proclaimed and, and yeah don't get me started on them um, <laughs> so we try and differ, differ in just, Actually, I, I might I might just become one tomorrow you could do you could do you know all you, all you need to do is, is get a little bit of engagement and that shows you that you've got a LinkedIn Brilliant. That's it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Do you know what? Technically, if somebody has informed me of becoming a life coach is very similar as well. You can just go, oh, hi, I'm a life coach because I've been alive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, 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 the, the, the call I had just before this with, with a, a client we're doing some work with at the moment, and, and she asked me, you know, why, why is it that you don't call yourself a coach? And it's one, I'm not qualified. I have not taken any qualifications to say that I'm a coach. Um, I I mentor people, but I'm not a mentor in, I've not taken any formal qualifications. What we do is is we we look at what people's goals are. We put a strategy in place and we achieve them. Some people will come to us and say, I want to go viral. Okay, we can help you go viral. Why though? Yeah, because I'll get loads of leads. No, you won't. Just because you've gone viral does not mean you're going to be financially successful. Yeah. I mean, lots of people might like your stuff. My my uh, best performing post in terms of organic reach is five and a half million, which you think, well, that's that's good. If if I needed, if I wanted to pay Facebook to get that sort of impression at a at a ten dollar um, cost per mil, which is a thousand impressions, that cost me half uh, fifty fifty five thousand pounds. Yeah, I did it on one post that I wrote the night before and it went out and it went viral. Did I get much business from it? I got some, but the best performing post in terms of business got 2,000 views and it was a video. We picked up six clients from it. Christ, okay. So it's, yeah. It's not about the views. A lot of people, are, all these people that I will, will use that, oh, well, I, I get the views and, and I get the business. Are they? Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. There's, there's not many people that put um, their credibility on the line as much as LinkedIn coaches, because it only takes a phone call to work out whether they're full of shit or not. Yeah, yeah. You, you look at any one of those recommendations that they've got listed there and say, did, did, he, did he work for you? Did he get any money? Oh, no, but she was really nice. Nice. Oh, yeah, that doesn't fucking count. But it's a recommendation. Yeah, yeah, because they liked working with them, but that doesn't mean they got business. And you say, what's the objective? Is it to yeah. be more popular on LinkedIn or is it to create re- revenue? Yeah, and, and if, if, if this, we've got a client at the moment and they've got just over 500 connections, they get no engagement whatsoever, but they're going through a process of um, doing a particular outreach and sending messages and having conversations. Um, and they're making thousands and thousands of pounds a month. 
because they're doing it they're doing objective based marketing yeah they don't need to have everybody kissing their asses going oh that was an amazing post mm. who gives a fuck nice. yeah. it rubs your ego but yeah. do you feel now that you're on the right career path for you i haven't got a clue <laughs> <laughs> No, are you enjoying it? Are you? I, I am. What, I'm, what I said when, when I left um, the, the recruitment firm was that I never wanted to work and put money in somebody else's pocket that I didn't think earned it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that for me, now I'm not saying that, that that firm didn't earn it, but it didn't feel right that I was busting a bollock every day and I was still driving a crappy 12-year-old Mercedes that, that kept fading every MOT. Um, and it was only a Mercedes because it was the cheapest one we could get at the time. Um, and he's driving around in his, in his, uh, his Bentleys and his Rolls Royces. And that, yeah. that, that, that thing, it didn't, I didn't like it. Mm. So me moving away and doing my own thing, I'm not driving around in a Bentley. I'm driving around in a nice Mercedes now, but it's certainly not a Bentley or certainly not that. But I've got balance. Yeah. So I played rugby uh, or touch rugby and so I retired from the, the physical stuff because I keep breaking. Um, but I played rugby yesterday. I played golf a couple of days ago. Um, I tend to finish it around three o'clock every day unless I've got a couple of meetings that I need to do. Yeah, yeah. I'll start at 9, 9.30 or sometimes 10. So I've got the richest thing that I thought I'd ever have, which is my own flexibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't give a shit if I've not got a million put in the bank. Yeah, you need enough, uh, and you need your life. Yeah, and and you know if if there isn't a lot of money in the bank, I've still got family, I've still got friends, I've still got the the car, the house, and things like that, which are are doing what they need to do to keeping me alive. Mm-hmm. Um, if someone that that struggles or has struggled and, and still does struggle, tablets there uh, with their 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 mental health, that has probably been the biggest epiphany moment for me is yeah. to stop chasing the cash. I, I, was, I was offered a job um, when I did some consulting work uh, back in 2019, which required me to go move down to uh, the South Coast um, and to be able to travel into London every other day. Uh, and the salary was 125 grand. And, and then there was a car on top, there was yeah. resettlement fees, there was, I got free, uh, free rent or free mortgage for a year massive massive sexy yeah, yeah. package but it meant working with somebody and uh, and being told what to do and when to do and how yeah. to do it and I, I just could not settle for that fair enough so. uh, yeah I think it's interesting right one of the things I know in HR is sometimes you talk to people and they're very unhappy working and and they'll give you all these really good reasons why they're very unhappy working and it's all the fault of the company or it's their boss and you go actually fundamentally you just want to you just don't want to actually do this because they're not because the company's not running the company in the way you want to run the company therefore it's shit therefore you don't want to be here but they're but you're too scared to leave or you don't feel you can so there's a lot of negativity about Oh, my, you know, my manager does this or much as that. It's like your manager does his job as a manager. The problem is that's not how you want to be. And that's okay, but that's not that's that's not yeah, business's yeah. fault or the manager's fault. That's your that's that's the fact you're probably not in the right place. And it's I think part of the problem is people are quite scared to admit that. Yeah. I th- well, every, everyone's scared to admit that they might be at fault. <laughs> yeah, true. It, it's well, it's not my fault that this is a crap job. Yeah. Move, leave. And it's easy for, don't get me wrong, it's very easy for me to say from a position where I am now, I'll just leave because you've got financial commitments, you've got all these other things like that. And, and, and I would never encourage anybody to risk things that they're not comfortable in risking. But for me, it was that or probably more mental problems, if I'm being brutally honest. Yeah. Um, so when you say, you know, am I, am I in the career that I want to do that? I'm in the position in my life where I want to be right now. Yeah. Um, That's- Next next year, uh, there might be, you know, a, a magpie with a silver thing flying past. And I thought, I'm going to do that. Um, <laughs> but I've got the ability to do that. And I can, and I can do that as, as you know, as a, as a business owner. That we've, You know, we are 100% flexible. We all work from home. We've got two office locations, one in uh, Cambridge and one, um, one in Tamworth. But that's, that's a contract that we can cancel whenever we want to cancel. We are truly flexible. Mm. 
the staff work when they want to work, not not when I tell them to work. As long as the job's done, I don't care. Yeah. Brilliant. I think you touched on a really important point there, Chris, in that people don't just work for money. No. Um, and, you know, Tracy and I support small businesses and it's, you know, sometimes it's interesting. Some, some of them can be quite challenging and they just assume people work for money and that's why they come to work. And it's like, yeah. no, you know, you, you just read a bit of research, yeah. right? The main driver will not be money as to why they choose a certain company. It will be that it's a nice place to work. It's fun. Yeah. You know, they've got flexibility. It's it's a whole raft of, yeah. of other things. So it's not bean bags and free fruit. I know that. Much. No, <laughs> I, I think yeah. Sometimes and people think it's free, money though. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you put a football table in and give them free pizza on a Friday doesn't mean it's a good place to work. Yeah. And I think people also often, particularly, I, th I think hopefully it's changing slightly, but you know, people often think they're motivated by money till they get the money and still realise they're bloody miserable yeah <laughs> sometimes you have to go through that difficult learning curve to say well I've got financial security I can go on holiday I've got a nice car I'm still going home in the evening not wanting to get up because I'm just miserable yeah. and, and I think again that's quite hard because almost to think that you're motivated by money is easy to try and work out what else is important it's actually quite complex and quite messy and quite hard yeah it is and I think I think for me the whenever we're looking at hiring somebody we, we made a mistake when we, we made our first hire um, and, and it was based on my want for a job to be done. Yeah. And we hired on the credentials that this person provided and she, she said the right things. Um, I probably didn't do my due diligence enough, so it was probably my fault. It's no problem. It was my fault. Uh, and when she started, she was shit. The, the first piece of work that she delivered was absolutely abysmal. And I'm like, well, it's, it's the first time and, and, and that pattern behavior. And then I realized it, it, it wasn't the fact that she'd applied for a job and, and given it, uh, and, and I'd given it her based on the fact that she could do it. It's the fact that I needed it to be done. Yeah. And, and I was filling a need rather than a requirement of it being physically, of it being capable. Yeah. And, and, and that big learning curve for me, we lost, we lost a, uh, a little bit of cash in terms of, of, of telling them to fuck off and all that sort of stuff as you do mm -hmm. um, we didn't use those terms by the way hr people um but <laughs> that was a that was a learning curve so when when we hired Gemma um we we actually hired Gemma from the school gates so Paul who uh who lives near Gemma uh, down in Cambridge um or Sapham Walden I can't call it Cambridge Sapham Walden um, they uh, all um, asked Gemma how things are because she was due to go back to work after her the baby. Um, and she said, well, you know, I'm, I'm dreading having to go back to work. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about such and such. And he just dropped it into it. He says, oh, do you want to come and have a chat with me and Chris because we might have something. Um, and we did. We had a chat. We had a meal. Um, uh, I had a very, very nice sandwich, open sandwich. Nice. Uh, and we and we talked about what she did so Gemma came from being a pharmaceutical sales rep um or sales area coordinator yeah. so you know it's what she you know she was qualified it from university she's very very educated that sort of stuff um and there we are interviewing her to write some copy for us um so it was it was total totally different yeah. she had no skills in social media she didn't even have a LinkedIn account well, she did, but I think she had like 12 followers. Um, and, and it was the fact that we went into that and we hired her based on the fact she was bloody good at, at talking to us. We enjoyed talking to her. She yeah. said the right things Thanks. in terms of what she wanted to do and where she wanted to do. She didn't want to uh, progress through the company. She just wanted to do a job a certain amount of hours so she had the flexibility for the kids at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that fit our narrative of what me and Paul, we both got kids the same age, that's what we wanted wanted to achieve as well, um, and and we hired her, and, and she's been with us now ever since, and she's been absolutely brilliant. I, I once I once was chatting to somebody about what they wanted in an ideal hire and about a particular job, and they said somebody who's willing to learn and has got the right attitude. I can literally teach them ninety nine point nine nine percent of what I need. I cannot do bugger all if they don't have the right attitude and they don't want to learn. Yeah, yeah. and that really did stick with me because I do think. I mean, unless you're talking about being a doctor, in what, in which case, I'd quite like to have gone to a medical school. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of jobs, you know, if you, really, if you if you bring the right people in and you invest 
enough time in them, you can get a lot better than you can just trying to pick the first person off the street who look like who look like they're good. Yeah, it is. I think a lot of a lot of bigger businesses, there's too much uh, managerial structure in place to be able to give somebody that free fall. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, at the end of the day, you know, you, as, as a CEO or as a director of a large business, you can argue to toss me if you want that your purpose is to put numbers on that bottom PL line. It's not to hire or create a culture. No. So a lot of businesses operate like that. They they purely see that, well, if you're not going to do the job, you can fuck off, we can replace you. Well, you can, yeah. but that's all you're going to be doing now for the next 20 years is doing that same routine of replacing and replacing and replacing. Yeah, yeah. yeah culture, it, it, you know, I think the problem is the reality is we do know that having a good culture makes a difference to the bottom line, but you have to want to do it and you have to be willing to invest a little bit in it. And most of them... If, if for most companies it just feels too hard and that's and they're very good at releasing statements that say this is our culture and then you talk to somebody who works they're like yeah bollocks <laughs> it's, you know, it, the I, I did a post yesterday about pride month um yeah. now i i tend to write something along the lines of whatever the latest national days or something like that um and i had a, a big piece about pride that i was going to do a couple of weeks ago when you know the start of the month or a week ago uh, and i never posted it and i'm glad i didn't because this opportunity for me to write this one came out and it was i saw an image of the bmw uh, logo that had been changed to have the colors behind it I thought, yeah it's quite a nice point nice, nice good thing and somebody had commented so this was i think it was on facebook or something somebody had commented i wonder if they've gone done the same in saudi arabia so i'm like oh i'll go and have a look bmw saudi arabia yeah no colored logo there oh no so that that for me was the the my brain's now going. Why as a business are you just ticking boxes? Yeah, we support all gay rights and, and pride and all the all the thing about that, but not in this country because it will damage sales. <laughs> yeah, we might get in trouble. Yeah. Do you know now? I can't remember which company it was. So this is a bit of a tangent, but um, there was one company that basically said, "This is our values. This is our morals." And we will stick to it wherever we are. And that included, and one of it was around, um, you know, supporting people who are gay, supporting gay rights. And they basically very openly said, if you walk in this building, we don't give a shit which company we're in. You, you, this is our territory and we won't accept, we won't accept this. And it, and it caused a huge problem. I wish I could remember who it was. It was a really big organisation that literally said, we know we operate in countries that don't agree with us, but you walk in here, this is how we live. This is our, this is our house. And... Whatever you want to do outside the door, we're not going to, you know, that's up to you. Yeah. This is us. And yeah. that's quite brave, but that's the difference between a company who's like, oh, quick, let's paint everything multicolored. Uh, you know, let's do a flag and a rainbow opposed to somebody who actually gives a shit and puts their money where their mouth is. There's, mm. there's two companies that spring to mind about it. And I've, I've, I've spoken about this on stage a few times. Um, once to, um, here he is. Hello, mate. Ah. You're on camera again, like you are every bloody day. <laughs> um, so there's, there's two companies. I'm hoping he's not going to start biting me because it's dinner time. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, you go and go and play with the plastic box. There you go. <laughs> right in here. Go on. Well, so there's, there's two companies that spring to mind that are... Uh, trying to toe the right line. One of them's Nike, one of them's um, uh, Gillette Razors. Or yeah. Gillette. So Gillette, quite a while ago, um, got into a bit of hot water um, about their razors being more expensive for women. You might have seen, seen it was all in the news that for you know for a, a single blade razor, it's something like twenty five percent more expensive for a woman than it was for a man. So for whatever reason i don't know whether where it was so what they decided to do is they came out and they made a statement saying we are an ethical brand we've listened to our consumers and we're now going to price our raises accordingly and they are both the same um so you know what brilliant that's fantastic but they are the being, they're still shaving monkeys and other yeah. other animals testing their products so for them to publicly come out and say we're an ethical brand hang on what are you doing just here that was a, a, a big, a, a, a real bad marketing ploy, a real good mm -hmm. one. I wouldn't say a ploy, but a, a 
decision was uh, was Nike or Nike, wherever you are. Um, and so when Colin, uh, I can never say his f f first name, Kopiaki or whatever his name was, took the knee in the national anthem, like seven, yeah, uh, yeah, five, yeah. seven years ago, however long it was, um, Nike came out very, very quickly and said, we support him. Yeah. Um, and then President Trump said, oh, you need to boycott Nike because they're supporting and they're going against our national, all that sort of stuff. Now, Nike are not stupid. They did that because they knew 100% that by supporting black athletes in, in a predominantly black area in terms of where they sell more products yeah. and to the demographic, they will be getting more support for that action than if they didn't. Yeah, yeah. Now, what, what happened was, was lots of, of, of racist arse bandits um, all around the world went around, oh, we're, uh, this is terrible, ah! And they went and brought Nike shoes and burnt them. They bought Nike shoes. <laughs> so uh, we're making a stand. We're gonna. Those are expensive give you shoes. Too, let's, just, let's just say. Yeah. So that hit all the media. But in, so overnight, their market share dropped. But within about twenty-four hours, it recovered four times. And so they knew what they was doing. They stood by an ethical standpoint, and they and, and they stood by it. And they they have done ever since. And that is, is a company out there. I'd question where they get some of their products made as whether it's ethical or not, but certainly in terms of race and, and, and culture, they've done a, they've done a better job there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, it's really strange what comes to, I know there was a, cause I, I use cruelty free beauty. That's one of my things. And, and it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be um, because a lot of companies who will have a statement that says we don't test animals, but then you'll see a little thing that says accepting countries required, which is China. And so they basically say, well, we won't test animals. Oh, except we actually quite like the money China gives us. So we're actually going to test animals there. Um, so there's a, there's a whole thing about that. But one of the ones that made me laugh was a few years ago. And again, I can't remember who it was, got into a lot of trouble because they released a vegan product um, on the basis it, it technically was vegan because it didn't have any animal products in, but they were still testing it on animals. <laughs> so they marketed it as vegan and, and legally it was vegan because there was yeah. no animals in it. But they're like, oh, yeah, but little Johnny Rabbit totally got this in his eye last week. But, you know, but it's vegan. Yeah, it's vegan. No, no animals are hurting the yeah. making of it. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just... Yeah, yeah. So um, I think this is one of those things we could probably talk about forever. So we probably shouldn't. I mean, well, we could do it on another podcast. What the heck? I mean, you know, it's, it's the age of uh, do what you like with the uh, social media. It's brilliant. Um, but I guess, you know, what would say would be your career highlight if you were to think about that? that have you got that moment? Um, my, there's a, there's a couple and they might seem rather, um, I don't know, egotistical. But there's, there's two moments in my life where somebody has said that I can't achieve something. And there is, there's a, a guy at the, my previous business, when I was given this, check for a quarter million quid to go and build a business. Uh, and he said, I'd never make anything of it. It would fail. You'd be a failure. You'd end up working in a pub and that sort of thing. He was a bit of a prick. Um, and and if, if I saw him today, I probably would just chin him just for the sheer joy of it. But he, he's one, 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 one person that's always been a bit of the mental nemesis. Um, so when, when I brought the, uh, the, the, the new Mercedes, um, he was at the traffic lights opposite me. Um, <laughs> and and it, it, he's still working at that business and he's, he's still doing very well, but he's being paid by the company. Yeah. He's not making his own money. Um, so I pulled in front of him and, and just waved um, and then drove off. <laughs> and that if, it sounds really petty, but that was a real big <laughs> uh, moment for me to be able to go. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, other one was, the other one was um, probably making my first sale on LinkedIn, direct sale on LinkedIn. Um, and we talked a good game and it was, it was the very first client that we brought on board post us deciding we were going to do, hello, that, <laughs> that we were going to do this uh, marketing sort of channel. Um, and it was 1,500 quid. First sale we'd ever done, um, and it was, it was, it was the very first time that I got the 
this could work. I think that was the, the, yeah, yeah. the epiphany. Um, getting a you know getting six figures or something like that from the business that wasn't really yeah a, a thing and, and, and how he's, he's biting my hand um and and all all of that it's not really been it's just been little things that have been a, have confirmed what i thought we could do and it's allowed us to do it so they've been more of a, 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 a highlight and chris if you were to be able to look back and talk to your rugby playing 16 year old self is yeah. there any advice that you would give yourself? Wear a condom. You don't mean <laughs> that. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. I love my daughter. So. Um, it, <laughs> but young um, viewers, young viewers do wear a condom. Yes. Yes. Exactly. The, the point is valid. Uh, <laughs> um, I think like stop biting me. You're being annoying. Um, it would it would probably be to not worry what people think about you. I, it, certainly early on in my career, certainly earlier on in playing days, things like that, it was all I, I cared so much what other people thought all the time. Um, and I'm now at the age and, and experience to go. If you don't like me, fuck off. I don't care. Yeah. I really don't care. It, it has no bearing on me whatsoever. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of people that will say, well. If, if people don't like you, they won't buy from you. They weren't going to buy from you anyway. If there's a personality clash, if there's something that, that you don't yeah. like about them and vice versa, yeah. you don't want the money. Yeah. I also think if you're authentic, if you are your authentic self, people see that and people are more likely to, to buy from you or want to work with you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, again, authentic is one of those proper marketing wanky buzzwords at the moment, but I'll forgive you for saying it. Okay. Um, She's lovely. You can. <laughs> there is. Um, I think there are multiple levels of authenticity on LinkedIn. Those people that say they are authentic and shout from the rooftop that they are authentic are probably the ones that aren't. Yeah. Um, those people that just do, they tend to be the authentic ones. I'm still trying to work out how I market. Don't want to work with assholes, but that's a that's a work in progress. <laughs> You just said it. You don't want to work with assholes. Yeah, you should did. You have. I have said it a number of times, actually, in all yeah. fairness, on LinkedIn. So I'm hoping, yeah, that might be, you know, maybe something I need to think about. <laughs> yeah. I think that's absolutely fine. You, the now, I, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not religious, um, and I'm, this little slight anecdote, um, there's a reason behind it. So I posted on Easter Day um, two years ago. Um, happy fake come back to life day. <laughs> now, retrospect, anybody that was religious, it could have been, or particularly Christianity, it could have been seen as being uh, offensive. And there was quite a lot of people that could take offense to it. What happened over a period of time was those people that took offense and wanted to do something about it left. Now, I would probably have never worked with those guys and girls because we wouldn't have aligned properly. What so we ended up losing, or I ended up losing about 100, 150, 190 followers, something like that. But we gained about a thousand. Now, what that did is it cemented where I sat and with people's minds about yeah. what I am about and things like that. So by defining, I don't want to work with dickheads, the mere fact that you've used the term dickheads will probably get rid of the dickheads. <laughs> uh, certainly some of them. So it's yeah. definitely worth doing. Yeah. The dog is literally trying to chew the plaster off the back of my heel. <laughs> we will make you scratch them, them before, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, before you lose any items. So what's next? What's next for you and your career and business? Um, we, so we've set up the proper network, yes. which is our attempt at um, uh, sticking two fingers up at uh, Americanized wanky networking, um, particularly BNI and things like that. So... Yeah. We, we have a, a, or I have a, a particular stance that if you're going to network with people, network with people that are going to offer value, not just because they're part of the room. Um, this whole idea that you have to generate referrals for people that are part of the membership. It's like bollocks. What, if that builder over there is crap at what he does, I'm not going to give him work just because he's part of my group. Yeah. So I had a, a, a bit of a bugbear with, with traditional networking and, and the pandemic helped to a degree to launch the proper network, you know, a digital version. Um, so we're going to be growing that um, 
to a degree, um, and not particularly too fast. I think we've got about 100, uh, well, about 80 members at the moment. Um, I'm just trying to remove the dog from trying to chew the blister off my foot. Go on. Um, <laughs> I, I know it's dinner time, isn't it? That's why. Things you never thought you'd say. Um, uh, but yeah, so the proper network, there's a lot of focus on that for us. We, we want to sort of uh, hone in on that. I want to get more speaking gigs. Yeah. Um, I've got a TED talk coming out in October. Um, that was meant to be the last year that got altered and everything. So I want to get that out and then perhaps look at doing some others. Um, yeah. This dog is going to go and become stuffed soon. Um, and and that, that's pretty much it. I, I'll go with what what, what happens. I, don't know. I yeah. have no plan. See you where it takes you. Yeah, Brilliant. yeah I think so. Well... <laughs> <laughs> before you lose your shoes i guess we should say look thank you very very much for coming on it's been really interesting and very very funny and Good, enjoyable yeah. and educational so ticking all the boxes are you are you going to be giving this a, a, a title based on something that happened like they do on uh, like breakfast podcast things like that sadly well i'm not quite that creative we do, we do do a little bit of a blurb which is you know from from the slowest uh, paper boy in the west to the shittest policeman in the north. Uh, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, always wear condoms might be another one. I'd always wear condoms. Good yeah, good so we would definitely. Um, but no, thank you. I will. Um, so I'll stop the recording now. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much.